Test. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the session. Welcome to the last day of the summit. Hopefully you've been having a lot of fun, learning some stuff along the way. Uh, no doubt you went to at least a couple sessions on containers. I hear there's, there may have been a few of those this week. <clears throat> this is building an engineering IaaS cloud to develop enterprise software at NetApp. Uh, that's quite a mouthful. Essentially, this is the journey that we had for building our private cloud internally at NetApp for our engineering group and how that's been helping us uh, with our dev test process. My name is Kevin Lambright. Uh, I'm a senior cloud architect in our engineering shared <coughs> uh, services group. Let's see if I can get this to work. All right. Real quickly on the agenda, I'm just going to do a brief history of our uh, private cloud that we built, uh, a bit of how we uh, came to OpenStack, put OpenStack in that environment, and really going to talk about uh, use cases around this cloud and how it's helping to transform our dev test process. Uh, then we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about a new service that we just introduced two weeks ago into it. Uh, that's uh, our software-defined storage on demand, and then I'll give a brief demo, talk quickly about where we're going in the future. All right. <clears throat> so real quickly, a little bit about the ESIS organization. I said this is the Engineering Shared Infrastructure Services, Infrastructure Services Group. This is essentially our internal IT organization for engineering. So we build uh, hardware, software, and virtualized solutions to, you know, for our engineering community. Did I get this thing to work? All right. Go manual. Uh, we currently operate in <coughs> nine R&D labs uh, throughout the world and serve a user base of you know, a little over 5,000 people. And out of the, the about 130 people that work in this organization, it's roughly a, a relatively small team of eight people <coughs> that are supporting the OpenStack, and that's both on the architecture side as well as the ops side. We are uh, part of a, what we call our Customer Zero program, and that's essentially, like I said, building services that use our own hardware and software products and we'll often take a lot of pre-release software before it's out there. We'll deploy it in our data centers much in the same way our customers would and try to build out um, you know, solutions uh, in, in a way, architecturally in a way that, that our customers would. So back in 2013, uh, you know, we set out to build a private cloud to help accelerate uh, our, our engineers uh, you know, and make them more efficient, essentially. Um, prior to this, it was your standard story. If you wanted a VM, you had to file a ticket with IT, you had to wait, uh, you had to give justification for why you needed it, and you had to wait two weeks, and, and maybe you would get one, maybe you wouldn't. <clears throat> so back in 2013, like I said, we, we set out to build this private cloud. It was, a, it was initially built on VMware and, and Hyper-V, um, you know, had capacity for roughly 500, you know, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 VMs. Um, and then we added, in 2014, we added OpenStack to the mix. Uh, we also put together our own portal, portal for it that spanned all of those hypervisors. Uh, essentially, you know, as, a, as an engineer, you go to this, you are asking for services, you're asking for compute on demand, you don't know which hypervisor that's gonna be served up from. All right. <clears throat> so today, we're at about 42,000 total VM capacity uh, and, and of that, our, our KVM OpenStack mix makes up about 36% of that overall by, by hypervisor count, not necessarily by, by VM count, but by host count and hypervisor count. <clears throat> so at any given time, we've got roughly 5,300 active VMs on OpenStack uh, in capacity for 15,000, and that's, that's changing. A year ago, it's, it's increasing considerably. A year ago uh, at the Austin summit, uh, you know, our, our percentage of KVM OpenStack was roughly 15%. So year over year, we've, we've more than doubled that. And we're on track to be at roughly 80% uh, of our hypervisor count by the beginning of next year. So we've made a significant investment in OpenStack, uh, you know, in, in, in increasing that, that investment considerably. At the heart of this uh, is our hyperconverged uh, solution that we put together with Cisco uh, called FlexPod. So as such, it's Cisco UCS Compute. 
uh, top of Nexus top of rack switches, and then our own storage in the form of you know FAS, E series, or you know more more recently with the acquisition of SolidFire a year and a half ago, uh, coming up with a SolidFire FlexPod solution, and we are running the community Red Hat community version of OpenStack RDO, uh, and we're we're sort of in transition right now. It says Liberty. We still have we we are transitioning to a V2 architecture, and we're up, as part of that, we're upgrading to uh, Newton. We're upgrading to Mataka and then Newton. So we still have some nodes that are that are back on Liberty, but most of it is either on Mataka or Newton at this point. And then uh, this session, I don't go into a lot of it of how we've done automated deployments and how we do you know, seamless, non-disruptive automated upgrades. Uh, there's a session 1.30 this afternoon. In joint, it's a joint session with Puppet Labs that is exclusively focused on more of a deep dive on the architecture of this and how we have uh, completely automated everything with Puppet. So why OpenStack? Like I said, you know, we built this cloud back in 2013. And obviously, uh, you know, started providing a lot of efficiency for engineers. They really started to like it. And so we really needed to scale this out. And we wanted to use OpenStack, to be quite honest with you, um, as a way of, of avoiding vendor lock-in, right? So a lot, same story as a lot of other companies. You know, to be quite frank, we also wanted to reduce our enterprise license agreement with VMware. And then uh, additionally, NetApp has had quite a commitment in the OpenStack community since 2011. Uh, you know, being part of the OpenStack, found, you know, members of the old OpenStack Foundation, we have quite a few developers that are developing drivers uh, for OpenStack. So, you know, we really wanted to start um, trying to use it internally as well. <clears throat> Let me just build this out. Sorry. Da, da. So I'm not going to dive deep into the overall architecture, but I did want to show this slide, sort of where we are. Like I said, we're in transition. Um, we went to essentially a region-based architecture, and region in this case is not um, necessarily geographical regions. This could, it's, uh, region for us is a, is a failure domain. Um, we have uh, you know, 15 compute nodes in each region. We wanted to cap it at that, mostly because this is what our, uh, this is what our ops team was familiar with in our VMware environment. So we wanted to have you know, roughly you know, a, a, a similar architecture as we started to build out uh, OpenStack. And you know, this, was, this was not day one architecture. There was a, a journey to get there. The session this afternoon goes more into how, uh, what that journey looked like. But then the other thing is we also moved to, to have uh, Keystone and Horizon in their own separate region uh, because <laughs> putting them all, all in the same uh, you know, all, all in the same stack essentially uh, was causing issues with performance. That, so then we got one uh, controller node per region and like I said, 15, 15 compute nodes. All right, so let's really get to how we're using this thing, why does it matter, how's it helping our engineering groups. <clears throat> As you can imagine, developing an enterprise storage product uh, has a lot of challenges. Uh, it's fairly complex. We've got, in, in this case, I'm talking about our, our flagship operating, storage operating system, ONTAP. We're a portfolio company. Uh, so the, the things I talk about here, the processes, are, are really for uh, the, you know, the bulk of the people that are working in engineering ONTAP. Uh, so we've got 25 years of code development. This is, you know, the code's not the same that it was, but it's, you know, 25 years, we've obviously added a lot. A lot of things have been refactored over time, but we still have, you know, uh, that legacy uh, with us. 26 million lines of code, uh, 1,000 dev and QA engineers working on this uh, across multiple releases. And so we'd have traditionally long, uh, long release cycles, right? So anywhere from 18 to 24 months, three major releases ago, on our 8.2 release, uh, which is you know, roughly five years ago, we had 64 uh, branches for development. And so you can imagine there's a lot of code in these different branches that never got merged together, uh, never saw each other you know, with its different dependencies for months at a time. <clears throat> and so when it did get merged, not only would there be a lot of merge conflicts, but that would lead to a lot of bugs. And again, you know, uh, perpetuating this long, lengthy release cycle. And as we add more features and get more complexity, 
you know, it, it snowballed and got even worse. So obviously something needed to be done. And so very next release, you know, one, one major release over the other went to a single development branch and we're able to uh, reduce our, our cycle time down to 15 months, right? And still, we're still working on that. We're, we're at about a six month release cadence now. Um, and talk about how we got there. And you're gonna say, you know, duh. <laughs> so essentially what, what this boils down to is we, you know, we went to a, a continuous integration uh, test model that we introduced in 2012. And today you would say, of course, everyone does CI, CD. That's a, that's a no brainer. Um, but you have to understand where it come from. Like I said, 64 development branches, uh, things being checked in all over the place. So that was a pretty uh, major transform, transformation for us, right? And so uh, essentially what happens is we kick off a build every three hours and we run two hours of continuous integration test. Really what drives this whole thing is what we call a virtual test bed. And that, um, you know, at, at the heart of that is our ONTAP simulator. So that's soft, our software defined, our software version of it that engineers uh, use for development and test every single day. And then a couple of clients thrown in to help drive load because this is a storage system. And uh, we need to be able to scale those out very rapidly. If we tried to do this on hardware, uh, you know, this, this wouldn't work, not only because it would be very hardware intensive for one, but we couldn't scale to uh, as rapidly as we need to. And one of the reasons we need to, to scale is to be able to satisfy uh, these two hour tests running across 20 different teams. Um, but we also have, it's not just the continuous integration test. Uh, you know, it's you know, sort of bread and butter and it's interesting in and of itself and everything. But you know, what, really continue, what really allows a thousand people to work in this single code line is auto bisect and auto heal. So essentially when a test does fail, and we've hardened the test, we have a whole process for how we harden the test and how we introduce them into the code line. When a test does fail, uh, we, we essentially uh, cut up the code line, start bisecting the code line uh, all around the, the uh, check-in that, you know, for those, for those two hours and spin up a whole nother set of virtual test beds to be able to go off and run tests against those. So, uh, you know, it's an iterative process, but we need to be able to do this very quickly. And that's why I said we would only, we could only do this, um, you know, in a virtualized environment. And then we find the offending check-in, we remove that check-in, do another build, spin up more virtual test beds, uh, run it until we get a pass, and then the line is healed and, and we're good to go again, right? So I would love to stand here today and say, this whole thing is powered by OpenStack, it's fantastic, it's really saved, you know, our entire uh, process. <clears throat> that's not the case today. Um, you know, maybe in a year or two we'll get there. This, this area is ripe for re-architecture. Like I said, we introduced this, uh, you know, this new process back in 2012. We didn't even have an OpenStack environment until late 2014. So as our global engineering cloud has grown, uh, as OpenStack has taken over more and more of it, this is an area that's ripe for re-architecture. All right, so now let's talk about the test side. And I say test, not QA, because this includes both developers and QA, um, we've driven a lot of test process back into our development organization, both with unit test, the continuous integration test that I was talking about, and our, our developers are also starting to write and run a lot more automation as well. So this is an area that is much more entrenched uh, with, you know, served up by our global engineering cloud and OpenStack is, is a big part of that. So up on the upper left, is what we call our shared compute services portal. This is the portal that engineers can go to and just get compute on demand, right? So we're building a storage system, we're not building applications, so what they typically need is just, you know, either load generating clients or clients that have their, their tools in them, either for development or test, or a test environment, uh, you know, baked in so they can just go ahead and run their automated tests. And the reason I say flexible, or flexible virtual compute here is because uh, not only can they go, go there and get templates that are already predefined, of which we've got, you know, hundreds of them, they can uh, layer their software, layer their tools on top of that, and then push that back into the global engineering cloud for reuse by other teams. If we had, you know, like I said, there's, there's roughly eight people working on our OpenStack environment. If we had, uh, as that small organization, had to take those and engineer that and, and build that into our OpenStack cloud, you know, we'd be way behind uh, what our engineers actually need. 
The other, uh, another area where it gets a lot of use is in what we call our hybrid cloud lab. So this is a part of our data center that we have extended out to public cloud. And we've got roughly 300 people that work in that lab today. And that's growing. We have a lot more products that we're starting to build that are, that are now working in the cloud. And that is um, you know, a, a smaller part of our OpenStack environment, like I said, growing. All of the, the on-demand compute from there comes from OpenStack. And by far, our largest consumer of our global engineering cloud and you know, as part of that OpenStack is what we call our common test lab. So this is where we've consolidated uh, a lot of our hardware and engineers go there and get both hardware and virtual or some combination thereof of test beds. This is where the majority of our automated tests get run. And that's a, another key part of you know, how we're able to go from that lengthy release cycle, 18 to 24 months down to six months, not only having those continuous integration tests, but having a higher level automated tests that, that our QA group runs to the tune of about 20,000 uh, tests a month. And uh, you know, that, that uses quite a, bit of v, quite a few VMs. We've got roughly a 6,000 VM turnover per day in that common test lab. And today, the way that we accommodate that is we do a bunch of pre-pulling of those VMs. They're, they're mostly based on VMware. We revert to snapshot when they're done. But with uh, advances that we're making in our V2 architecture with OpenStack, we're able to now boot uh, those, those VMs on demand and offer them up faster than we can actually revert back from snapshot. So in about a month or so, we're gonna take that, we pre-pull like about 15,000 of these to accommodate for spikes. We're gonna take that 15,000, which represents you know, a bunch of wasted capacity and be able to convert that over to OpenStack and offer it up on demand and still meet the 6,000 uh, VM turnover per day. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about enterprise grade software defined storage. So this is something that we just introduced two weeks ago into our OpenStack environment. It's essentially software defined storage on demand. Uh, so our software defined storage as a service. So this is uh, powered by our untapped select product and, and obviously OpenStack. This is not a marketing pitch. Um, if you wanna know more about our software defined storage, I've got links you know, in, the, in the back here or you know, come talk to me, I'd be happy to. What I really wanna do is just tell you a little bit about it so we can talk about you know, why this is valuable, why we put it in our, our OpenStack environment on demand for engineers. So essentially this is our ONTAP operating system running in a VM uh, on, your own, on commodity hardware, on your own hardware, right? So no engineered hardware <coughs> in, in this case. It, it's available on VMware ASX today. Uh, we've got a version that's coming out on KVM later on this summer with our 9.2 release. And you can do either single or four node clusters. We're working on the ability to do other cluster sizes as well. That's on our roadmap. Today it's direct attached storage, uh, you know, with uh, disk in the, in the host. We're also working on our roadmap is uh, array storage. And then you can get this in different configurations depending on what your requirements are. This is a common reference platform. Um, doesn't really matter what the vendor is. The, you know, the solution is vendor agnostic. The reason I show this is because this represents a test bed that we have in our common test lab. Um, you know, four node cluster. The key here is really that we run it in the same way uh, that our customers would in this configuration. So it is one on tap select instance per host. And that's, you know, while we have people that need to run it that way because they're, they're either doing development or they're testing the solution, um, that actually represents a fairly expensive test bed for us to, to get and maintain. So what have we done to offset that, to help that out? So essentially what we've done is, <coughs> um, you know, made these available on demand as part of our OpenStack environment. And at the, the base of it here, at the foundation, is that same FlexPod configuration that I talked about at the beginning. With the addition of, you know, we added solid fire into this uh, for, for, to be able to offer up different performance tiers to our engineers. So we've got different, different classes of people, you know, that are using this. Again, same thing, so that we, uh, configurations that we offer out to our customers, you can get a single or a four node. Uh, it's completely on-demand provisioning, dynamic in roughly 20 minutes. Um, and, and I'll go in, I'll show you in the demo, the demo is not 20 minutes. Uh, you know, exactly how an engineer would, would go request one of these things. 
Like I said, in about 20 minutes, you can have a four node cluster. Uh, it's roughly seven to 10 minutes to get a single node cluster. So that's, you know, that's pretty fast. Um, that reference architecture that I showed on the previous slide, the turnaround for that is usually hours, if not days, depending on um, what, you know, what level it needs to be built up again from the RAID controller up um, or in what state the previous tenant on that left it. So, you know, hours, hours to days versus 20 minutes. And the rest of it is, you know, it's our same OpenStack architecture uh, that we have in the, in the rest of our cloud. It's all, you know, KVM RHEL 7.3 RDO. And uh, on the performance tiers, so we've got, if, if you're a developer uh, and you're not, or, or just doing functional tests, you're not gonna drive any load to it, then your instance is gonna be backed by, you know, our FAS uh, solution. However, if you, let's say you're part of the system test team, or you're trying to do you know, something that requires a little bit more performance, you're actually gonna drive load to it, then uh, your instances are gonna end up on solid fire with different QoS tiers. That's completely abstracted in, uh, you know, away from the user. They just say, I, I want you know, the, these different levels of performance. It's a relatively small environment that we put together now. Um, we, you know, not the entire engineering team is not working on our software defined product right now. So you know, we've got about, 200, 220 instances available in this environment. Um, you know, sort of <clears throat> in a split, you know, more on the, on the functional side. And so, yeah, what are the key benefits of this? Really is all about efficiency, VM density, and lower cost. Uh, you know, being able to provide that lower cost uh, test bed on demand. Rap rapid provisioning we talked about, and then being able to provide different performance tiers uh, to engineers based on their different, uh, you know, different needs. So, you know, why does this matter? Why do we even care? A couple of reasons. First off, this represents the first software-defined storage offering that we've put in our, our cloud, uh, you know, making it available. Most of the other VMs are relatively simple. Uh, you know, they, they provide a tremendous amount of value today. Uh, but this does really represent, you know, a little bit higher level, more complex service uh, that, we, that we put together. And we, we also have, you know, we're a portfolio company, so we've got a number of different storage offerings, uh, of which a number of those also have software defined. So this really provides a blueprint and a roadmap for how we could be able to offer those up as part of our uh, engineering cloud on OpenStack as well. The other thing is, it does provide a reference architecture for customers. Most customers would want to use our software-defined storage solution as underpinnings, uh, as you know, maybe as part of your undercloud, as foundational services there. However, we have had some conversations with customers where they've got, uh, you know, there was one large service provider that had a fairly simple use case. They had a number of NFE templates that they wanted to replicate, you know, throughout as, as you know different clouds that they had. Um, in different geographies, and so they were very, it was all based on OpenStack, and they were interested in using, uh, you know, ONTAP Select as a single node, uh, just to be able, for its snap mirror capability to be able to replicate. So it has opened up a number of conversations, uh, regardless of how, how customers want to use it, or not, uh, you know, as the case may be. But it does provide some interesting conversations. And then the other thing is, as a side project of this, we, we created some heat templates for this, um, this is something that we could, you know, we want to make available on our, our NetApp GitHub page. Um, we don't use them internally. We're using the OpenStack APIs. We put together a bunch of Python classes and, and scripts. Um, but, you know, that, that's not something that we'd really want to or really could share easily with, with uh, other people. So the heat templates, um, you know, really are. All right, so I'm not gonna go through this bullet by bullet. There, there's a whole other session that could be on how we built this, how we architected it, the challenges we had out along the way. I just wanted to hit on a couple of things here. Um, you know, part of this is when we started this project a little over a year ago, we didn't know what we didn't know. Uh, we understood what the requirements were, but we didn't know what, how to necessarily map those different components to OpenStack constructs. <coughs> uh, avoiding template sprawl. So, this is, uh, you know, we've already got hundreds of templates anyhow, but think of this as, you know, bring your own image is essentially what it is. Um, so, you know, developers are working on this, they're building code in their sandbox, and then they point at this image and say, build me one of those software-defined clusters based on this image. Uh, so, 
that's something that can happen you know, multiple times a day, spread across hundreds of engineers, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, within a week or so, you've got 2,000 templates. So you know, we, just, we just decided, okay, forget it, we're not gonna do templates at all. We create a bootable cinder volume, we DD the image onto that cinder volume, connect the rest of the cinder volumes to, that, uh, to, to the Nova instance, boot up and, and away you go. Um, and, and, you know, and because of that, we're avoiding having to do you know, multiple copies of the image. Uh, you know, none of these images are the same, so you're not really gonna be able to take advantage of uh, cloning and um, image caching anyhow. And then the other thing you know, I wanna hit on is just sort of the last, second to last bullet here. Is this an infrastructure or is this a software defined storage problem? Like I said, this is code that's under development uh, you know, by the ONTAP engineers. So when we do hit a problem, how do we know, you know, how do we dig in and figure out is this a problem we're having in our OpenStack infrastructure today or is this a problem because, you know, there was some bug that was introduced in ONTAP. So we've got, this is a, an evolving process. Like I said, we just rolled this out two weeks ago. We have an ops checklist that they go through and then we're working with our, our software defined, uh, our software defined storage development team uh, trying to, you know, do this jointly and, and work this out until we have a, a really solid process for how we figure that out. All right, way too much talking, let's do a demo. So what I'm gonna show here is essentially going to our portal and, and requesting a four node cluster. Uh, like I said, this is, you know, roughly takes 20 minutes. I've sped up parts of it considerably, but I just wanted to show you the process and, and really the, <clears throat> excuse me, the simplicity uh, that our engineers get. So what you've been staring at here for I believe this is going for a few seconds, is our, what we call our shared compute services portal. This is where, our, yeah, this is the web uh, UI version, but you can, everything that's done on the web, you can also do uh, via the uh, API as well. Is this actually running? No. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Let's jump out of here and see if we can. Looks like this might be the longer version. I'll have to skip through through portions of it. Um, essentially, so there's a separate link uh, for what we get. We call S dot, right? That's our internal name, software defined. I don't have any, so let's go ahead and, and create one. You're presented with this relatively simple form, and I'm not showing a damn thing. <laughs> yes. Sorry, so it's relatively simple form. You basically go in and you say, you know, this is, this is what I want. Uh, this is the testing purpose, I want one or four nodes. Let's go ahead and select four nodes. We only have this available in our RTP facility today. And then I go say, okay, I want, uh, how many data interfaces do I want? Let's go ahead and pick eight. Uh, I can personalize this a bit with the, the uh, DNS name that's gonna show up. And then this is really the, the crux of it right here. Which kind of, which performance tier do you want? Um, and, and so, you know, again, standard goes on to our FAS, mid and high go on to our different QS tiers and solid fire. Let's go ahead and pick high. And that then you just, the other thing is you have to f say how many data disks do you want? Let's go ahead and pick 10 uh, and 10, 10 gigs. And then this is really, I was talking about bring your own image. This is where, uh, you know, a developer or QA specifies this is a full path to the image, this is a KVM raw image. And then the other thing is we do cluster health check afterwards and you can decide whether or not you wanna keep the cluster if it fails. Then you just press go and it's off running. 
mm, let me stop this first real briefly. I just want to. So we press go there. Essentially what that did was it passed it off to our workflow engine in the background. And this, this is the thing that sort of spans the different hypervisors and can select different, different regions and different clusters. And essentially what it did is it says, okay, this is only available in our OpenStack cluster. Um, let me hand this off to the provisioning script that's going to do that. And so uh, what that provisioning script does, like I said, we use the OpenStack APIs. It goes off, it creates all of the sender volumes that it needs, you know, based on the system volumes that are needed for this, as well as, um, you know, the number of data disks that you asked. Each, each of those data disks represents a, a different uh, sender volume. It goes off and, and dynamically creates the ports that you need based on the number of uh, it, data interfaces that you requested, builds, uh, creates the Nova instances, ties it all together. <laughs> and then I can just go, I can go look at the logs, uh, the build logs and see what's happening there. This is the part that takes 20 minutes. Let's speed this up. I went, I went a little too far. Essentially, what, what, what happened was, you know, as it, as it went through and did the build, it also we connect serial ports to it. Serial ports are very important uh, to be able to do debugging as well as to be able to jump on the console. And then um, what I did, what we do is we present the Telnet line, you know, basically to the end user saying, this is how you actually get to the console. And what I was showing here is just actually jumping in that console and ONTAP is uh, doing its boot up process. And uh, this happens to be the first node because that's the one that does the clustering. That part itself uh, takes about 10 minutes. I'll skip through that. And then, um, you know, when that's done, you can go get on the, the uh, cluster management port, which is essentially a virtual interface that spans all of the nodes in the cluster and can fail over. So what I'm showing here is just going through a couple of different uh, commands showing, yes, that the four node cluster is up and running. Uh, there's the different disks and stuff like that. And I'm just showing here, uh, yes, it is, it is indeed OpenStack. Here, here's what they look like in the Horizon dashboard. We don't give uh, end users the uh, the ability to go in and log into Horizon itself. Like I said, we have the, that abstracted shared compute services portal. And then, uh, because it is, uh, you know, it's the same on tap, you can use all the same management tools. Um, so I'm just showing here, going into our OnBox system manager. It was much better with everything sped up. <clears throat> All right, so there, you know, we're in, there's our four node cluster. Uh, from there, you can, you can go in, you can create the higher level constructs with aggregates and, and uh, storage virtual machines and volumes and all that good stuff. It is full fledged, you know, on tap. So, I'll bring that back. All right, so where do we go from here? We've already uh, you know, given our engineers a lot of value with our global engineering cloud, uh, with on-demand you know, compute, as well as that new software-defined storage as a service that we, that we introduced two weeks ago. But we'd still like to offer some higher level services. This is not a you know, baked, set in stone list, but there's a couple of things that we would like to add Bare metal as a service, it's not a huge demand from our consumer base, but it is something we'd like to take a look at and see what we can provide with Ironic, maybe database as a service. Um, you know, there's a couple of other things. And then Manila, we've got developers that, that write Manila drivers for our storage products, and that's something we'd like to be able to offer out to our engineers as well. File, file, file share as a service. 
containers, like I said, you know, uh, so many sessions on containers this week. We have uh, a number of groups that are now starting to work with containers, and so we, we really want to get our head around how we're going to provide centralized services for containers, so containers as a service, as well as are there interesting architectural things that we want to do with maybe putting our uh, control plane part of OpenStack, uh, you know, into containers and, and containerizing that. Um, the V2 OpenStack architecture, you know, I think the session this afternoon goes into that a little bit more. Uh, but, it, you know, essentially we're going to move from that region-based architecture that I showed to availability zones. And rather than having, limiting each of those to 15 compute nodes, you know, that'll scale to hundreds of nodes. And the other thing is, like I said, we're on track to be at, uh, you know, 80% OpenStack KVM in our global engineering cloud by next January. Um, you know, that's going to reduce our, our, you know, enterprise license agreement with VMware. That's cool. Really, though, or most, more significantly, this represents a, our significant commitment to OpenStack. So our journey with OpenStack has been going for, you know, roughly two and a half years now. It was a crawl, walk, run. We're at the, you know, certainly at the walking stage now, you know, moving towards uh, uh, run. But essentially for internally, you know, we're, our, our private cloud, we're, you know, almost all in on, on OpenStack. And then lastly, just a few resources here. Uh, I got a couple of links on if you want to know more about our software-defined storage solution. There is a pointer to the session last year uh, at the Austin Summit uh, that, that, you know, was a discussion of, of what we've done, how we built this out. Um, but I would really recommend going to the session this afternoon at 1.30 where Seth Forgosh is gonna talk about what we've done, uh, how we've built this out, more on the architectural side, and how we've automated the whole thing with Puppet. And then lastly, go to netapp.io, <clears throat> excuse me, go to netapp.io for all things containers and OpenStack at NetApp. And that's it. <laughs>